by thanking uh, four individuals. First and foremost, I would like to thank Valery Dimshitz. Valery Dimshitz is to St. Petersburg what James Joyce was to Dublin. <laughs> or, uh, is uh, because he's still alive, our good friend Chaim Be'er is to Jerusalem. Namely, he is the muse of the city. He is the memory bank. He is a walker in the city. He is the perfect companion. And all the arrangements for this evening uh, we also owe to him. So, many, many thanks to Valeria. I would also like to thank in abstentia uh, Alec Franco, uh, whose building we are, uh, who is hosting this uh, event uh, at this cultural center that he has kept alive and uh, active low these many years. And uh, that is a, a great accomplishment. <laughs> Um, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of my good friend, Rabbi Michael Gordon, who is sitting here and came especially for this evening, uh, not only because he's a good friend, but because uh, he made the Shidduch with Elisha Orelovich, uh, who has agreed to uh, accompany me uh, so that I can sound like a much better singer than I actually am. <laughs> and uh, I have never had this experience before in my life. I have never performed uh, with a musical accompaniment. So this is altogether uh, a wonderful uh, treat for me and thank you for taking the time. And he's actually more nervous than I am because uh, he knows that I'm not a trained singer. <laughs> and we only had one rehearsal. So thank you all for coming. Um, I owe the concept and the title of my lecture uh, to my mother, Masha Belcher Roskies, whose 20th yard site will be on uh, the 8th of September. So, once upon a time in the summer of 1973, my mother retold her whole life's story through song. And it happened because a young uh, anthropologist, then she was really at the beginning of her career, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, uh, we know her as Bindle, uh, received a major grant via the YIVO Institute in New York to study the East European Yiddish folk song in its social context. A long title, but every word is actually significant and especially the social context. The uh, thesis uh, of this project, the underlying idea was as follows, that by 1973, the corpus of Yiddish folk song had more or less been rescued. We had met most of the songs, we had the texts, we had the music, um, obviously other songs would uh, come to light, we didn't know in 1973 that the Anski uh, expedition, uh, all of those recordings were extant and would be discovered and digitized. But for all intents and purposes, we knew what the Yiddish folk song corpus was. What we didn't know was how these songs actually lived, who sang them, to whom, and when and why. And it was really the 11th hour to try to reconstruct how these songs lived in Eastern Europe. So uh, Barbara was looking for live informants who could record their entire song repertoire in all languages, because it was also important to restore the multilingual context of Yiddish song. Um, most singers sang in more than one language, and if they uh, sang in Yiddish, chances are they sang in other languages uh, as well. So she asked around, uh, and she contacted my sister, uh, Ruth Weiss, who was teaching at uh, McGill at the time, and said, do you know anyone 
who could be an informant? And my sister said, I certainly do. My mother. Why don't you uh, tap my mother? She knows many songs. She's a wonderful uh, singer. And uh, Ruth was really thinking that this would take the weight off of her, that there would be somebody else uh, that my mother could talk to instead of uh, her daughter. There was a young graduate student at the time looking for work. His name was Michael Stanislavski. He was an undergraduate student at Harvard, and this was the perfect summer job. So they gave him a woolen sack tape recorder. Remember, huge. You could kill a person with that uh, woolen sack, and he had to schlep it with him uh, each time. And he brought it to my mother's home in Montreal, and he sat with her for 12 sessions. And all he had to do was press the on button, and my mother started talking and singing and telling her whole life story. Uh, actually, what happened is that on the 12th session, uh, we actually hear this on tape, Michael says, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mrs. Ruskies, but there's a questionnaire, and I have to ask you certain questions <laughs> on this questionnaire, and we never even got to the questionnaire. Uh, so, er so he had to remember that, uh, to fill out the, the questions in the questionnaire. So in those 12 sessions, my mother recorded 167 songs in Yiddish, and in Russian, and in Polish, and in Hebrew. And I mention Hebrew because she graduated from Beit HaSefer <coughs> Banot uh, Yehudia in Vilna. And her, she remembered songs from kindergarten, from elementary school. Also, her Hebrew diktuk was excellent. She never made spelling mistakes with the Hebrew component of uh, Yiddish. Uh, a song in Ukrainian and also a song in Gypsy, the words of which she did not understand. But once a Gypsy girl, beggar girl, appeared in the courtyard on Zabalna Corner Troka and sang a song. Uh, and my mother remembered that song, and so she recorded that as well. Now, two-thirds of these songs we had never heard before. We had never heard them before. So how is that possible? My mother loved to sing, and whenever possible, she would accompany herself at the piano. So how was it that that what hap where did all these other songs come from? So, the answer is social context. Context is everything. When did we ever hear my mother sing? Well, the, the opportunities were as follows. We would go, uh, our dacha, we didn't have our own dacha, we would go to a place called Cape Cod uh, in Massachusetts. It was a very long drive, but we would go there once a year for the summer. Uh, for two weeks or three weeks. And it was a very long car drive, um, eight hours one day and another four or five hours the other day. And we were little children and it was hot in the back seat and we were fidgeting and my mother would entertain us by singing. So what kind of songs would keep us occupied and preoccupied for a long trip in the summer? So, lively cabaret songs. Beneath Mira Schneider, La Gitter, Gitter, Nea Fabenreb, Mafiter, Fiter, Knemma, Roisty, Ganze, Wat, Ganze, Knemma, Roisty, Ganze, Wat, Ich Lega, Weinan, Alte, Schmate, Ay, 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 and then we would all sing Ay, ay, ay. Or, um, Paul Yitzhakadila, Balshaya Krakadila, Anna, Anna, Kalodna Yabila, and we didn't understand what the words were, but it was one of those lively songs that kept us going. My father drove and my mother sat next to him. So one of her jobs was to distract my father. And she would do that by singing duets. My father would sing the harmony, and that was the only time we ever heard my father sing. My father was a textile manufacturer, he was a scientist, he did not indulge 
in singing. But when my mother was sitting next to him and drawing him out, he would sing. And the songs of Mordechai Gebirtik. I will have much more to say about Gebirtik. So that was one moment in our childhood. And then there were the holidays. My mother would sing for us for Hanukkah, and we had many Hanukkah songs in Yiddish, and that's when she would sit down at the piano and accompany herself. And sometimes also for Pesach. At the end of the Seder, if it was a good Seder, and my mother was in a particularly good mood, she would sit down at the piano and she would sing. And she came from a very musical family. Her beloved sister, uh, Anna Varshavska, was her music teacher at Kofanovsky's kindergarten. And Anna Varshavska went on to graduate from the Berlin Conservatory of Music. Later, she settled in Kovna and ran a choir called the Engel Choir. So, what did we learn from these interviews, these 12 hours? We learned that songs accompanied my mother throughout her entire conscious life, and that songs were that which gave meaning to her life. And there were even occasions where songs kept her alive. It was through singing that she uh, was able to overcome uh, many crises in her life. And it was thanks to these 12 hours of interviews that I had a lot, a lot of material that uh, ended up going into this book, Svana uh, Yiddisha, which is really a book about my mother. Yiddish lands is really about her and dedicated to her. This is the library copy, um, so you're welcome to read it. And in the English edition, there is actually a CD that comes with the book, and it includes ten songs from her tapes. <coughs> Um, other songs of hers formed the basis of a film uh, that I made called Daughter of Vilna, The Life in Song of Masha Vosky's. And we're, um, we're going to put this movie on the website of the center so that you'll be able to watch it. It's a 45-minute documentary made in 1999 by Josh Woletsky. And you will immediately see who my mother was and her personality coming through in song. So tonight, everything that I am about to do is inspired by her example and by something she repeated several times in her interview. And that's where the title comes from. My mother would say, Ich darf von einem eigenen Sinn. So what did she mean by that? I pray for my own sitter. It can be interpreted in any number of ways. It could mean, I march to my own drummer. I am my own person. And that's my mother in her rebellious mode. And nobody's going to dictate to me what prayers I have to say and when I have to say them. I have my own sitter. Thank you very much. And this is what I got him from. But it also means I have my own sitter. She didn't say I sing for my own songbook. She said I it down for my egg and sitter. That means that these songs are my sacred texts and they are no less holy to me than a prayer book. And song for me is a form of prayer, which she does say more than once in her interviews. So that's another aspect of my mother, in her romantic, uh, Jewish, national mode. And both sides are equally true. So what, why did I choose this as my own title? What, are, what do these words mean to me? Although my own song repertoire is a fraction, a fraction of my mother's, and although I can only sing songs in four languages and not in six, I can sing in English and in Yiddish and in Hebrew, and I still remember a few songs in French that we learned in school. And although my mother was a much better singer than I am, uh, I am the only one of our, our children who did not master the piano. All, I come from a very musical family. I was the Muzinik. I did begin taking piano lessons, 
but I quit, and she let me quit, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I completely identify with the idea of life as davening from your own sitter. I think as a master metaphor, it's absolutely brilliant. And I also believe that singing is a form of davening, and that davening is a form of song. And that's why, for the duration of this, I'm going to put on my yarmulke. And I've also brought my actual sitter, which uh, we will need uh, for the end. So this is actually the sitter that I pray from. Not metaphorically, but the real thing. The real, this is my sitter. Um, and here's the question that I pose. What songs go into my sitter? Which means, what are the most authentic Yiddish songs? And my sitter, even though I, I can sing in David in Hebrew, but my, I would say, existentially, my most sacred texts are in Yiddish. That is what I do, devoted my life to. And, and I will try to explain how that played itself out in my life. And why, for me, these songs are not secular songs. They may, their provenance may be secular, they may come from a secular mindset, but I, what I will try to convey to you is how they can mean something uh, spiritual and how they can function as a form of prayer. So, we're ready, all oh, for almost ready for the first song, which you have. Um, so you will have. We only have ten song sheets, so uh, not enough to go on for everyone. The first song actually has a specific uh, date, and the date is April, 1919, when uh, Vilna changed hands for the fifth or sixth or seventh time and Polish legionnaires um, captured the city and they perpetrated a pogrom. <coughs> and in the midst of that, the playwright, uh, Aleph Weiter, was um, placed in front of a firing squad. He was accused of being a Bolshevik and he was shot. And at his funeral, this was the song that was sung. My mother says, Vilna Youth, the Vilna Jugend, by which she meant, of course, herself and her, her classmates and her generation, followed his beer and they sang. The lyrics were not written for uh, the funeral. They, they came from Avram Bazin. Uh, Bazin was no longer living uh, in Eastern Europe. And the melody you will recognize because you've heard it set to other words. A very famous song uh, called uh, Animamin, or Sachki Sachki, by Shal Chernikovsky, is also set to the same melody. So, ready. <laughs> Thank you. 
different setting. My parents escaped uh, from Europe in the summer of 1940 and they found refuge in Montreal, Canada. And um, my father's brothers and uh, sisters-in-law had already settled there before and they were living in a neighborhood on top of a mountain, very posh neighborhood called Westmount, and that's where my mother and father and their two children born in Europe moved to. And it's uh, the year is 1942, and there's a wedding to which they are invited at a very fancy synagogue, kind of like the St. Petersburg synagogue, you know, a Horschel you know, where the rich people davened, and it's a wedding, and the bride is walking down the aisle, and the musicians begin to play. And my mother says, that is our sacred him. How dare they desecrate our him in the middle of this war? Terrible things are happening. I'm getting out of here. We are not staying in this accursed neighborhood one moment longer. I don't want to be here. And so she told my father, we're moving out and we're moving to another neighborhood. We're moving back to where the Jews live. I'm not sure she said it in those terms, I'm putting words into her mouth, but the fact of the matter is they, they moved from the mountain down into the valley, into uh, a Yiddish-speaking neighborhood, 90% Jewish, Utremont, and what's more, she enrolled her children in a, her first her oldest son, Ben and Benjamin, and then in turn all four of us in the Yiddish Hebrew day school. And Yiddish became the lingua franca of our home. The only language spoken in our home uh, was Yiddish. It's 1942. And I think that this was my mother's way of reconsecrating their lives to that which they held sacred and, um, and to those who were left behind. So, we all received an exemplary Jewish education. The four of us, my brother Ben, my sister Ruth, Eva and I, graduated from the Yiddish Volksschule. Yiddish Volksschule was a labor Zionist school. What does that mean? The ideology of labor Zionism was that you had to learn to breathe from both of your nostrils, Yiddish and Hebrew. You have to learn to be internally bilingual. Both languages are equally important. Uh, 
Loshen Kodesh is the language of our sacred past. Ivrit is the language of our utopian future. Yiddish is the language of our lived presence. That was the ideology of uh, the Volkshule. And it was a Yiddish secular school. So what did that mean? It meant that the Jewish calendar was our calendar. We adopted that, and no other calendar mattered. Um, but as in um, Mamlachti schools, in uh, it, it, Israeli secular schools, the emphasis was on the national holidays. For example, Hanukkah, uh, Pesach, or even Shavuos. Everything was um, interpreted in a, in a national way. And for every holiday, of course, there had to be songs. So the Jewish holiday cycle was a major source of Yiddish song. And part of our core curriculum was not only music, but singing in a choir. So now, willy-nilly, we come back to Avram Rezin, who sat, wrote many songs that were adopted for Yiddish secular schools, both in Tsarist Russia and in Poland and and now in the New World as well. Now, the importance of the next song is that it was we, children, who brought this song into our home from the Volkshule. So, this was now our repertoire, which would become part of our family ritual. And the next song was one that we would actually sing, either at the Seder or after the Seder. It's a song about Maranos. So what do Maranos have to do with the Pesach Seder? There are no Maranos in the Haggadah, but it reflects the Jewish historical experience. And it also reflects the anxiety of Jewish modernity. Once Jews became emancipated, once the promise of emancipation was held out to them, then the question became, all right, then what do we still hold sacred? How will we keep our identity intact? What is it that we are still willing to die for as Jews? If we are not commanded by God, where... Uh, does, where will the commandments come from? And so one of the core ideas was observing the Passover, baking matzahs, reading from the Haggadah, well, that is a core value that we cannot compromise. And that's why Abram Raisin wrote this song. Oh, 
from my perspective, sitting underneath the piano, Yiddish was not a minority culture, but a world-class culture. And it was spread all over the globe. But even as a young person, I understood that all of these writers had one thing in common. They were born on the other side. So the question eventually arose in my mind, so who would keep this culture alive? Where would a native-born generation come from? And that is how slowly the idea for creating a Yiddish youth movement uh, was born. I didn't belong to a youth movement. I desperately wanted to belong somewhere, so I started my own. And uh, it was called Jugendhof, the call of youth. And it was called into being in 1964. And the way it happened was a chance meeting that I had with a 15-year-old boy named Gabi Trunk, who came to Montreal on a visit. He was a young Bundist. And, and his teacher had told him that there was a young Yiddishist in Montreal whom he should meet. And that was me. Um, and at this meeting, um, for the, we, just on a lark, we, tried, we began speaking Yiddish to each other. And that was the Eliezer Ben Yehuda moment, where we discovered how exciting and challenging it was for people of the same generation to communicate to each other in Yiddish. Not uh, vertically, to our parents, to our teachers, but horizontally, to people of our own generation. So Yugendhof was called into being on the 31st of August, 1964, and um, we would then meet every year uh, in December at our annual conferences. And what would we do? We would sing. And this is where we learned a whole new repertoire of songs. The core curriculum of this new song culture were songs of the Vilna Ghetto. The songs of Hirsch Glick, Zognish Kemal, but you can't sing Zognish Kemal because it's the partisan's hymn and it's like singing Hatikva. But you can sing his love song, Stil die Nacht ist euch gestärmt. You could sing Sutzgewehr song, Unter deine Weiße Stern, and you could sing Kacar Ginsky's uh, Jugend hymn. And, um, and this was written for us because Jung is jeder, 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 where is Vilno? And we were very young. We were 16 years old and 17 years old, so it wasn't wishful thinking. And there was also uh, one stanza which spoke to us uh, specially. Geit a boyer, geit a schmieder, lomer alle gain mit zei. Half of the members of Jugendruf, if not more, came from the Bundist family. So this was the Jewish socialist um, the moment. And you're welcome to sing along. Wie der 
And I waited and prayed that there would be a day when I could serenade a young woman with this song. Um, Kinder Jung, Drei Tachterlach, then mit Masel gesund und leben, Salz der Tachter, will weil ich euch geben, will ich. Okay. So, many, many songs. My mother knew them all. But our all time favorite was none of the above. None of the above. But another song of Gebirtik's, which was the theater song. Um, and my mother grew up in the Yiddish theater. I mentioned the, Yidd the Eastern European Yiddish folk song in its social context. For my mother, the most important social context was the Yiddish cabaret. Die uh, Bande and Agarat. My mother went to the cabaret whenever they were in town, uh, which could have been every night of the week. And she knew their entire repertoire. And the repertoire was lively and jazzy and satiric and contemporary, like this song of Gebirtik's. And you will immediately recognize that it's a theater song because of its structure. It starts off with a recitative. The mel melody is not so important. And then comes the refrain. Now, this became our family anthem because it's sung by a woman, progressive, aggressive. She's giving her bashful boyfriend a pep talk. Look, get your act together. It's time to learn how to dance. Who is that? It's obviously my mother. And whom is she addressing? Leib, Leibke. Well, guess what? That was my father's name. Label Voskis. And so... There were, when people were, born, were married into our family, my brothers-in-law thought that this song was written for my parents by Gebirtik. It stood to reason, uh, but in fact that was pure happenstance. Um, and what we also liked about it is that it, it was post-ideological. The lyrics are, you can be whoever you want to be, ideologically, a Bundist, a Zionist, a member of the Aguda. That's not what's important. Here's what's important. Okay. <laughs>
wenn kein Gut nicht gern. Du bringst mit dein Aktionen mich von Geduld aus. Du musst ich lernen tanzen, ich schwer bei unser Leben. Hell und ich ist ein noch mit uns euch. Magst du sein, wer du bist, a verbrennter Zionist. Ab und do wird's wärmen, geht es on. Alle ist in Zeit und Zeit, und euch die an gute Leid. Tanzen, Tango und Schadenbrotstorm. Lenke, tanzen, scherben, sagen nicht. Ihr werdet im Film, Tränen weit dreht. Stell sich mein Lieber an Gegenüber und hängt zusammen. sing uh, when at our greatest family occasions. Uh, we sang it at uh, Aryeh's Bar Mitzvah. Uh, we had a klezmer band to, to back it up. And you will actually see a part of that performance in the movie. It's incorporated into the movie that we made about my mother, a daughter of Vilma. So, so what's the most authentic part of the Yiddish song corpus? Hymns are very important. Die schönste Liedgesangen, Jugendhymn. These are songs designed for group singing. They're rousing. They create a sense of solidarity. Holiday songs. And now we see even topical theater songs that can be sung as solo, as duet. But my mother says, and I think this was passed on to us, that the most authentic core was Hasidic song. Now, you have to remember this. She grew up in Misnagdik Vilna. There were no Hasidic with kapotes and lampeas walking the streets of Vilna. She never saw any Hasidic until she was 15 years old, and she went to the opening production of Anski's Dibuk of the Vilna Truppe. And it begins, as you all know, with this spooky scene 
and they're singing a Hasidic niggin on stage. Ay, 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 and this is a song that um, uh, Yoel Engel collected um, uh, as part of Ansky's uh, expedition. This really was a, a Hasidic dveikas nigan, a melody without words. My mother says uh, on her tapes that at a certain point in her life, she decided that Hasidic song was the authentic core. here, but um, <coughs> at a critical point in, in my life, when I was looking uh, for new meaning, and I realized that this Yiddish secular world that I had grown up in was no longer sustainable, was no longer sustainable, that the institutions that supported it, the Yiddish press, the Yiddish theater, <coughs> Uh, political parties, oh, the whole Yiddish secular world was collapsing. We saw it from up close because in Yugendruf, we were, they tried to mobilize us as 16 and 17 and 18 year olds to prop this world up, but it was too late. We couldn't do it. Uh, so when I was um, 20 years old, I joined a neo-Hasidic commune uh, called Chavorat Shalom. It was a combination ashram, shtibel, kibbutz, house of study, rabbinical seminary, you name it. This was America, where everything was possible in the 1960s. And I joined a group of uh, refugees, and I use that word advisedly. We were all refugees from a form of Judaism which we thought was devoid of meaning, was collapsing, and we were desperate for something that we could call our own. And Hasidism became our address. Um, I use the analogy of Schiffsbrider. My, You know, when refugees cross the ocean, I like my parents did, you meet people on board who are fellow refugees. They are fleeing one world and they're going to freedom. And they're called Schiffsfrieder und Schiffsschwester. And these are relationships. You'll never meet these people again. But these are the most important relationships because you are at that critical point in your life where everything is about to start over again. Well, my chaverim in Chavarat Shalom are my Schiffsfrieder to this very day. I am bonded to them in a way that is extremely powerful. It's as if we had gone through the army together. I mean, this it, it really was the most formative experience of my life, were the two years that I spent. Now, because Hasidism was loomed so large for us, um, we needed a way to signify that bond. And I have to say that I was the one who came up with the idea of the following song to represent who we were and what we were striving to accomplish. And by the way, there's a whole chapter devoted to this in the book called Kotsk. Where does this song come from? And how did I come to introduce this? And how did it become the official hymn of Kabarak Shalom? I knew it from a record, from a recording by Ruth Rubin, who was a very important, one of the pioneers of ethnomusicology in North America. And she recorded this song from Yankov Zipper. I knew Yankov Zipper. He was uh, the principal of the parish shulet. Uh, it's not a song that was ever part of any school curriculum 
because it's a Hasidic pilgrimage song. And you don't teach a Hasidic pilgrimage song to little children in a Yiddish secular school because it wouldn't mean anything to them. But it meant a great deal to us for the following reason. The, the technical terms here are very important. Kotsk is doch bin koin ha We are going, we are walking to Kotsk. You cannot drive to Kotsk, you must go on foot because Kotsk is doch bin koin ha There's two ways of reading it. It could be bin koin ha instead of the temple, or bin mokem ha is the place where there is a temple. But for us, our Chavra in Saraville was bin koin ha This There was no other temple. This was the center of our spiritual universe. And the other thing that's important is the word Euler Regelsein. So every stanza develops this core idea. Regel means you have to go on foot. Regel means Lehit Ragel, Agivonschaft. You can't just go to Kotsk once, you have to get into the habit. And Regal is a holiday.
So, you see where we're going uh, with this trajectory of song. Willy-nilly, we're moving backwards from the new world back to the old. And we are rediscovering traditional forms of Jewish self-expression. Nigunim, we're beginning to sing Nigunim again. I propose to you that we, today, are living in the midst of a Nigunic renaissance, the likes of which the Jewish people has never known before. New songs, new nigunim, new religious music, not to speak of the klezmer revival, but what is happening now in terms of Jewish song has never occurred before. So, we're moving back to Eastern Europe. And one of the great miracles of my life was that I could witness the miracle of Soviet Jewry with my own eyes. Sheda and I, before we knew each other, had been sent here when it was the Soviet Union to make contact with Soviet Jews. We didn't know who sent us. It was a secret mission. We knew it was secret, but how secret? We discovered only decades and decades later. It was run by Lishkat HaKesher, which was a secret arm of the Israeli government. Um, and then, I don't have to tell you, the world changed and the Soviet Union collapsed. And we were able to go back, which was in, it, in and of itself miraculous, because when we came here in 1969, 70, 71, we were followed and, and we had a file, a secret file, kept on every one of us, and we knew that we would never be able to go back to the Soviet Union. But here it happened, and um, a new world opened up. The university where I teach, the Jewish Theological Seminary, created the first degree-granting program in Russia, called Project Judaica. And in February of 1993, it was my privilege uh, to be the first professor of Yiddish literature, teaching Yiddish literature in Yiddish in Moscow since 1939. We had a class of 21 students, uh, hand-picked. Uh, we were there uh, February through May, and then we came back again in December of 1993. 21 students. We began the curriculum with Yiddish, and then they after they mastered Yiddish, they went on to study Hebrew and other subjects. An amazing group of young people, perhaps the name Anya Sternschis will ring a bell. Alexei Sivertsev went on, to, went on to become a classical scholar. Vasily Shchedrin, a Jewish uh, historian. But this was part of Ergegebu, the Russian State Humanities University. And the rule was that it had to be non-confessional and non-denominational. We were teaching Judaic studies. We had to keep religion out of the classroom, and we absolutely observed that. However, uh, we had a dormitory, and a kosher dormitory at that, and there was not, no one to stop us from celebrating uh, Jewish holidays, like Hanukkah, for example, or Purim. So, we made a Hanukkah party and a Purim party, and we invited the students. And we had a resident singer, who was Anya Sternschis. She was our nightingale. She knew all of Vertinsky by heart. And I'm not kidding. She could sing for hours and accompany herself uh, on, the, on the guitar. It was amazing. But they didn't know any songs in Yiddish. They only sang Russian. Well, what was the purpose of that? Why did I come to, there, to Russia if we were going to sing Russian songs? So I decided the time had come. I was going to teach them their national anthem, uh, a piece of Soviet Jewish culture, that they should know that there was a Yiddish culture and, uh, and there were songs that were written. And here's one of them. 
about a Jewish collective uh, settlement in uh, Crimea called Jankoy. Mm -hmm. Vitebsk by bicycle 
1987, these kinds of pilgrimages have become part of who we are and, and, and how we, we try to uh, reclaim our sense of space. So, uh, this was a very intense trip. We covered 1,500 kilometers in 11 days. Talking Hebrew, non-stop. 8 o'clock till midnight. Amazing, yes? In Buchach, uh, Allah, you remember, uh, we bumped into you and a whole busload of pilgrims from St. Petersburg. Two busloads met in Buchach on that uh, that summer. Um, here and there we did some singing. Uh, in Jitomir, we celebrated Chaim Nachman Galdek's Yortzeit, and we sang some of songs of some of the poems that were set to music. But uh, there were long, long, long stretches, right? And you can't talk all the time. You have to have something to sing during these long intervals. And this is what we sang from Kosov is Kitev. And the reason we sang it is very simple. We were there. We actually were from Kosov is Kitev, and we crossed the very bridge uh, that is described in this song. You will ask me, is this an authentic Hasidic song? Well, is the Kosov song authentic? I don't know. I believe it is, but I, have, I couldn't absolutely attest to it. But this is what we sang from Kosev Piskitev.
closing in on the end. Um, I think the question that I posed is really not relevant. Authentic, not authentic, what does that really mean? Um, it becomes authentic as you sing it. The secular can become holy. Um, in Hasidism, and, and there's a very important concept, let atar panui mine. There is no place that is empty of God's presence. So you can take anything and sanctify it. You can take a, a Napoleonic marching team and turn it into a nigan. You can turn a peasant's uh, melody and turn that into a nigan. And I would say the same holds true, you know, for Yiddish theater songs, for example. They are suffused uh, with a religious spark. And here's the last example. A, uh, we will redeem the sparks of Aaron Saitlin's Yiddish theater song. He wrote it on commission for uh, Maurice Schwartz, for the Yiddish uh, art theater. Uh, I don't know what play, uh, but it's a song about Reb Motel, Reb Motel, well, Motel you. Is this an historical figure? I don't know. I don't think so. But what is authentic is that he addresses God as do in Yiddish, <coughs> in the most intimate way possible. It's a I-thou dialogue with God in a language that God understands very well. And Reb Motenyu goes through the entire day, morning, noon, and night. Now, I think that if Reb Motenyu can daven from his own sitter, then so can I. And so we'll sing it through the way it was written, and then we'll end with the liturgical adaptation, uh, which I made up. And I think you'll see that it's pretty seamless. Ready. <laughs> Ma 
ובים ובקרב הקדושים תזכדש ובלשון חסידים תתרומם ובקרב הקדושים תתקדש אוי צדיקים צדיקים